away they go. Really quick getaway from Felix Rosenquist. And for us and Chris Gunnar, he's done Chris it. Goes Fred right by him. The chequered flag, and it is a monumental day for Felix Rosenquist. The Berlin E Prix is underway. Do not <laughs> hit your teammate. Oh, no. A 10 second penalty has been awarded to Felix Rosenquist. Sebastian Buemi will get the points. So that was the Berlin doubleheader and this is Formula E Street Racers. This week we've stayed on in the German capital to bring you the latest from the world of all things electric. And in a country famed for its motoring innovation, the two go hand in hand. Audi and motorsports have been inextricably linked forever. If you think back even in the World Rally Championship when they came with the Audi Quattro spitting flames out of the back of the car full sideways, which was a mega, mega era of rallying. More latterly towards the Le Mans 24 hours and endurance racing where they basically set the trend. But as ever in motorsport, we're looking towards the future and what the next car is going to be and the next technology is going to be. And in 2016, Audi shocked the world of motorsport, announcing they were leaving the World Endurance Championship after an 18-year run in order to focus their attention towards Formula E. Well, I think there are several advantages, really, why Formula E is interesting to us. Uh, you can create a very good link to, really, the people living in the cities, which is the place where electric mobility is going to be the most important. Audi and APT have been an association in the German Touring Car Championship since the early 2000s. They're a very strong racing team. We're a very strong manufacturer, and so therefore it's very understandable that uh, we keep those associations going. Audi wants to develop and to step in officially as a factory racing program, and not just supporting the team in the way we did in the past. Audi are not the only Germans looking into the all-electric series, with rumors of BMW, Mercedes, and Porsche interested in participating in the future. You know, we've now got a tie-up with Andretti. We're seeing how it goes. Uh, of course, when the technology starts to take the next step, that's when it becomes really interesting. Well, I think we've led the field in this electromobility. You know, you saw the i8s on the track with the customers. I think that's a great idea. The i3s are out there as well. So we think there's a good technical edge and a good piece of innovation that we can bring into that field. German manufacturers have been very active in not only electric car technology, but also in Formula E. Historically, if one has gone into a category, the other ones follow, they never like to lose. And so we've got a kind of, and have had in the past as well in other championships, got a world championship, but then you've also got a sort of internal German championship as well, which creates some good hard competition, I can tell you. At the end of the day, uh, the product needs to show its strength. The product needs to be able to perform in the same way as a traditional car with a combustion engine. It needs to have the same autonomy at the same price or cheaper. I think once that happens, uh, it's going to be all done. From German technology to France's finest, and I'm not just talking about the cars. Switzerland's Sebastian Buemi may be the shining star in the Renault Edam stable, but he's not necessarily the most famous member of the team. That accolade belongs to that man over there, who recently took us on a reflective drive around one of his favourite circuits. Coming back to Monaco, it has not changed very much in the last 50 years. It's still iconic. For a driver, if you're not world champion, would like at least to win uh, Monaco once. In my generation, we really knew a period where it was absolutely, I almost say, undrivable. <laughs> it was very, very demanding and physically unbelievable in terms of concentration. The, the power on the engine was more than 1,000 horsepower with mechanical gearbox. When you change 2,000 times during the race, it was so timing and so difficult to not to do a mistake. You knew that if you miss a gear once or twice, it was finished. Obviously, what we have done with Formula E from the beginning, for us, and especially for me, it has been a big change. Our expectation at the beginning was zero expectation. I mean, we did not know. We won the, the Cross of the Championship. We are still leading the third year, but 
my opinion, and I can say that it's going to be more and more difficult. The big work is really between the driver and the engineer. Most important, to bring confidence to the driver. Only the confidence of the driver can make a huge difference. It's so easy to make a mistake. When you do a mistake in Monaco, a small mistake can destroy your confidence. And I remember 86, every lap I've done on the track with the car I had at the moment was really, you only have this feeling maybe two or three times in your whole career. That means you, you do, when we say only one with the car, you know, and uh, it is a, a feeling that you, you can't explain. And I, I had that in Monaco, and I tell you, it's, uh, it was a dream. While Alan is adapting to change in the racing world, one constant that remains is the need for drivers to be at the very peak of their fitness. And there's no one who takes his training more seriously than DS Virgin Racing's Sam Bird. 99.9% .9 of racing drivers take fitness extremely seriously because in this game you lose more than you win. It's, it's, it's simple, even the best, they lost more than they won. Fitness is absolutely crucial in motorsport because driving these cars is incredibly stressful and difficult. There's so many aspects to driving a racing car that are exhausting. It's not only physically exhausting, it's mentally exhausting. So when I'm driving at Le Mans, there could be a four hour stint that I need to do after 20 hours of racing already. I've had maybe one or two hours sleep. And also my Formula E car, it doesn't have any power steering. So every single time I correct the racing car, I'm basically dragging 850 kilos back into neutral position. It would be a crying shame if you weren't fit enough to hold on to these race cars and you threw it in a wall because you just weren't fit enough. And how do you explain that to your race team? My training regime, I'd like to do big cardio sessions where I'm uh, you know, slugging it out on the bike or maybe do a, a quick one hour run, see how far I can go in an hour. How quickly can I burn a thousand calories while running or something like that. There are times in the gym where you, you feel a bit like, oh, I just can't be, I'm not feeling it today. But then you remember what you're trying to achieve, what you're trying to accomplish, and that kind of kickstarts you again. Every single race, there's a, new, there's a new goal, there's a new dream. There's something that I want to accomplish and achieve. You know, fighting for a, a different position in the championship at the next race, trying to achieve a win instead of a second or a third place at the next event. So I've never had a situation where I've thought, damn, I wish I, was, I wish I was fitter. And you never want to get to that situation. So I think that's why everybody trains so hard. Motorsport is, it's, it's a team sport, essentially. The mechanics work on my racing car day to day and I work on bettering myself, whether that be the driving on a simulator or working on myself in the gym. You put everything combined to the race weekend and if it all fits seamlessly, if I'm doing the best job I can, if the mechanics have done the best job they can, if the strategy works well, if the engineers are on top of their game, you know that you can come out with a win. Let's see how fighting fit Sam proved in Berlin as we see how the teams and drivers experienced round seven and eight of the championship. The way they go. Terrible start for Lopez. Heidfeld's up in the third, he's trying to defend. The two DS Virgin purple cars get together and look at Daniel App, the second green and gold car, up the inside as well, being very bold there, but Degrassi's lead is intact. On garde la tête droite et on va le passer. Sarazan up the inside and Nelson Piquet. Hey, now we are closing the gap, man. Keep the space. Oh, oh what a big oh, up from Nico Prost. Lopez behind you, he's just struggling. Got to move, oh, Wemby trying to go past. Oh, yes. You have slightly more energy than Heidfeld. But Nico Prost picks up eighth place there from Mario Engel. Wemby is uh, trying to attack D'Ambrosio here. Oh, there's a move from Nelson Piquet. Yep, sends it early up the inside. Oh. Oh. 
being shown there. Rosenquist is 1% better than us. Wemmy again, Wemmy. turn nine. He loves that corner. Lucas is going defense. Look already, yeah. defensive. He's done Just it. Goes right, right the by him. Yeah. There you go. Keep the space. Oh, oh. Quist. Whoa, and Degrassi locks up behind him. Box this lap. Box this lap. Trois, deux, un, go. Pass. Yay, that's De Costa staying out there. And there is Jean Eric Van going around the inside. Hello, Boemi's going for it. Sending it early. Yeah, a just long, let him go. long yeah. way up the inside. Okay, Seb, c'est très bien. On est les plus rapides en piste. Big move, he's oh, making it. Oh, he likes that move down the inside into the that hairpin. Was a long, long wow. way back. Yeah. That was a lunge. Oh, and straight down the inside again. Sends it long and late past Nico Prost. The checkered flag awaits. And it is a monumental day for Felix Rose and Christ. We did it, man! Woo! So good, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Away we go. The Berlin e Prix is underway. And the pole position man, Felix Rosenquist, heads the charge. The Berg and Lopez twosome again, wheel to wheel. This target feels ridiculous. Head down, keep going. Still two by two and damage. And really. a three wide. I got a hit big time in the rear. Oh, more oh. contact. Yeah, Heidfeld up three or four spots already in that red and white Mahindra. Degrassi can't allow Buemi to go and away. for it too. Okay, energy is good, but battery temp is on the edge. Same pace as P1, same pace as P1. And there goes Prost, past Oliver Turvey. Tam Rush in front of you. The wind is a bit stronger. Third goes long around the outside. <laughs> Lopez oh, is still mate. there. Do not <laughs> hit your teammate. Oh, no. It's rule one of racing. <laughs> yeah, good move. Good move, Chita. And John Eric Byrne has just passed yeah. Lopez. Yeah. Good job on energy. Evans just passed Heidfeld back. Temperature on target. There we go. There's the pass into turn nine. Lovely. And turn your lap. The box, box, box. Four, two, one, go. He's close. He's oh. to the end. just trip over oh, each other. No, exactly what Rosenquist oh. didn't need. A 10 second penalty has been awarded to Felix Rosenquist. Oh, oh. that was close. And there's the grassy again. Look how loose it John Eric got. And he's got a van yes. gets in really deep. What a move. Good job. Good job. Tell me what do I do to get them John back. Eric Vern right now. There oh, they are. Around the outside. Oh. Vern's gonna oh. fight oh. it. Contact. Oh. Did he push me or was it me? A uh, pit stop problem means that victory does go to Sebastian Bueno. The reigning champion is back on the top step of our podium. Okay, bravo Seb. On a gagné. Super. Confirmation then that those two podium finishers take Felix Rosenqvist up to third in the title race. In second, it's still Lucas Degrassi with Sebastian Buemi 32 points clear. Time to catch our breath, but still plenty more to enjoy when we return. Living your boyhood dream. A change for charging. And the potential racing stars of tomorrow. This week, street racers have stayed on in the German capital, where Berlin hosted round seven and eight of the FE Championship in a weekend doubleheader. Now, this would have been a new experience for some of our drivers, but not for one of the veterans of the sport who's been there since the beginning. My career started when I started go-karting back in the days, like 92, 93. But when you're a young kid, I was about six, seven, you don't really know that you want to do that for the rest of your life. And then the click moment, I think, came when um, Ayrton Senna died, which actually was a, such a big impact for Brazil that uh, that really like, got me thinking that, okay, this, I might do this as a, as, as this is what I want to do. Any guy that innovates their industry inspires me. So Senna was the first one that took motorsport to another level. I think the first point after that was when I moved to cars. I was 17 and I moved to Formula Renault in Brazil. 
And I think the next step is when I was in university and I get a call from Renault F1 team uh, saying, uh, we want you to be part of our development program uh, for uh, F1. It was like only five or six spots and they would pay everything, my, like the cars, and, and it was like a dream come true. Then racing Formula One 2010 was another step. And then the next big step was when I joined Formula E uh, in 2014 and start, won the first ever FIA electric racing uh, race uh, in, in Beijing. I'm very lucky to have a, a very um, helpful family, always supported my choices, always gave me the opportunities and the right education. So my, my father also for me is a, is a role model on how I want to be. And now, after two years fighting for titles, having done more than 15 podiums in uh, 20 something races, uh, I had an amazing run in Formula E and Formula E definitely will be the future of my career. I want to, most likely I will retire uh, in Formula E. Now, Lucas will be used to adapting to changes on the track during his three seasons with the sport, but off it, changes are happening rapidly too. And it's getting our tech expert, Mark, all charged up. Currently, electric vehicles need to be plugged into a power source to replenish the battery. And, well, that can be just one more charge cable than we all really want to be carrying around with us. But there is a new way forward, wireless charging. It's an ingenious way of transferring electricity across thin air and it's being used right here in Formula E to charge the Qualcomm safety cars. So Steve, tell me a little bit about exactly how this works then. Well, the way that you transfer power over the air is what we call magnetic resonance. If you run a current through a coil, through a wire, that's going to generate a magnetic field. Then the other side, the transformer has a coil where the magnetic field causes a current to go on the other side. And all we're doing is we're separating the field. That's how we're able to throw electricity over the air through magnetism. So there's a pad on the floor and there's another pad, presumably, I haven't seen it yet, but underneath the car and you line the two up. In practice, as a driver of a car like this, how easy is it to get those two pads aligned? Oh, it's, it's super easy. I mean, if you think about electric vehicles, right, every auto OEM is coming out with electric cars. Yeah. But there's a, a, a user experience challenge with maybe some of the older generation. My parents don't want to plug a car in every time they go to the garage and they're worried about range anxiety. If you could just pull into your garage or pull into your parking space and the car starts charging magically and you don't have to do anything, we think that's really what's going to get us to the early majority and you know, kind of cross the chasm. So where else do you think this can go in the future? If you think about taxi ranks, if you think about buses, down the road, if you think about maybe the, the highways or freeways between major metropolitan areas, those might be electrified themselves. So what you're talking about is taking the pad that we see here on the garage of this, the safety car garage and embedding that into the floor and extending it over a long distance. Yeah, and, and, and that is going to be the future down the road. You can make smaller batteries. Cars don't need to return to the garage at night. If we still think about shared vehicles and autonomous driving, it's going to change the way people own cars and use their cars. And we really think wireless charging is a key component of that. Obviously embedding charges in the floor is an awful lot of work, even if just at traffic lights. But the ability to recharge cars while still on the move would be revolutionary. Making recharging low fuss and stress free makes driving so much more efficient and appealing. And wireless charging is going a long way to lightening that load in the future. While this type of charging may seem cutting edge to our current group of drivers, for the next generation it might be the norm. And to show how far advanced this new breed are already, the Berlin Epri wasn't the only race in the city this weekend. The story started with an idea to prove to the world that electric vehicles are the future. And that's how we came up with the Fontes E-Race. We got a project from school actually wanted to go from the north of Holland to the south of Holland in one day. But we as a team thought we could do it better and we went to Berlin. There were two teams part of it this year. Team Elegance, that's uh, my own team, and also Team Aeros was uh, joining in the Fantasy race this year. The race started in Helmond and uh, finished in Berlin. That's around 680 kilometers. The car was given us by Burton Car Company. We were 30 people. When we first got the car, we worked out all the plans, but unfortunately it didn't go uh, right and it crashed.
we wanted to continue with the project. Luckily, after the crash, uh, yeah, we contacted Burton Car Company and they provided us with a new car. And with this new car, we could uh, go on the project. We had around eight weeks to finish everything and we were really pressed for time. The battery management system was shot, the battery package was dead and the motor controller was uh, not programmed well. Because of the deadline, it was all hands on deck. Everybody needed to make around 40 to 60 hours a week and everybody was really pressed for time. But in the end, we managed to put it all together. Once the car was uh, ready, uh, we had to plan a route to Berlin. Uh, we had an estimation of how far we could go, how fast we could charge. So from that point, we just pinpointed the, the charges we need to take just to get there. The range of our car is around 100 kilometers, but to play it safe, we decided to charge every 80 kilometers. So after working many weeks and many hours, uh, we finally arrived at race day. We started early in the morning with Don. Eventually we had to stop like nine times. Uh, we have been charging for about uh, seven hours to get there. Fortunately everything came together. The team as a whole came together and we are really thrilled to be here. And we're able to get in Berlin in just one day with an electric car. I'm really proud of the achievements we've made. I'm really proud of our team. And it's just an amazing feeling to finally stand there at such, a, such an amazing event as the Formula E. So potentially some new faces to look out for in the future. Right now though, it's time to put a familiar face on the spot for some quick fire questions. Name. My name is Daniel Abt. Age. Uh, 24. Team. Abtjeff for Audi Sport. Favorite animal. Lion. Childhood ambition. To become a professional racing driver. Sporting hero. Uh, Lewis Hamilton. Toughest opponent. Uh, Lucas Di Grassi. Favorite country. USA. Worst habit. I'm biting my fingernails. Teammates' worst habit. Uh, punctuality. Favorite film. Django Unchained. Which superhero would you be? Spider-Man. Best dance move? Not existing. <laughs> Worst chat-up line? From something like, hi, I'm a racing driver. <laughs> Any hidden talent? Uh, I can do magic tricks. If you weren't a racing driver, what would you be? A rapper or a TV presenter. <laughs> greatest moment in life? Whenever you feel like it's the greatest moment, there's another great moment that's even greater. So I'm blessed that I had a lot of great moments in my life. Before we go, let's reflect on the weekend via social media. Possibly the image of the week is the show of respect between Sebastian Buemi and Felix Rosenvist as the Renault Edams team acknowledge the achievements of the Mahindra driver. Let's not forget too, a great weekend for Lucas de Grassi with two podium finishes made even more impressive by the fact he was nursing what turned out to be a broken ankle sustained in a football match a week earlier. No disputing the team of the weekend, Mahindra proudly showing off their trophy haul. But stealing the show in Berlin was this FE superfan, James Harmon, who described presenting Sebastian Buemi the winner's trophy as the best day of his life. Since then, Jaguar's Mitch Evans has been a busy man, rubbing shoulders with sporting royalty from the world of tennis and boxing. And one Faraday Future fan is already moving on from Berlin and focusing on what's next on the FE calendar. And talking of the FE calendar, the race venues for season four have now been released, with new stops in Santiago, Rome and Sao Paulo all included, and still one or two big cities to confirm before the new campaign starts. So that's it from the German capital where we faced our first double header of the season. But that's the way the pattern will continue for the next two venues of New York and Montreal. So plenty to look forward to. Until then, bye for now.